are going to continue this morning in our long abandoned series on the Tre Asar, the 12 prophets who speak to us from the Tanakh. So if you would this morning please turn with me to the book of Micha, or in English Micah, chapter 7. And it is the final chapter in this book. Now, before I go on, I do want to make a couple announcements. One is that uh, during lunch, some of our leadership will, well, our leadership will be gathering together for a few minutes uh, to discuss some issues that are upcoming. Uh, one of those issues is membership. We are, God willing, going to have some membership classes starting in four weeks. And some of us here are members, some of us are not, and some of us probably don't even know if we're on the membership list or not. And so um, if you have a question, please ask me. I have a copy of the list with me that June uh, put together and has been keeping for our congregation. And um, I can let you know what the status is. But uh, we're planning to have four classes over the next few weeks, starting two weeks from now, and we will go over uh, the basics of what we believe as a congregation and, and what we believe God has called us to and how we might uh, become members and become really active parts in, uh, in our body here in, uh, in Vancouver. So I wanted to let you know about that and invite you. Uh, even if you are a member, if you want, you're more than welcome to uh, sit in on these membership classes as we discuss matters that uh, I think are, are quite important. Uh, secondly, as Joel, or Joel uh, mentioned to us, we have now started the second or the, the series of readings that in the Jewish community occur every year. And every year in the Jewish community, at the very end of Sukkot, on the second day of celebration of, of Shemini Atzeret, that is the eighth day of the feast, the second day that is celebrated, as many Jewish feasts outside of Israel are celebrated not only on the day, but the day following, um, is called Simchat Torah. And in many synagogues around the world, any synagogue that has a Torah scroll, the Torah scroll has been carried around the congregation with great joy and with great celebration. The Torah scroll has been rewound because during the year it has come right to the end, to the end of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, and it is rewound to the beginning and the delight is not what it might seem to some from the outside. It is not an idolatry. It is not a glorification of the actual physical Torah that is paraded around the congregation. But it is that delight in that this is the Torah that God gave us to it, gave to us, and intends us to delight in in fact, commands us to delight, and we are delighted to go through the Torah once again. And so that's a little background. While our congregation does not have a Torah scroll, at least at this point, um, we are delighted to revel in the Torah that God has given us, that we can rejoice in his law, because it is light and it is life. And because it is light and life, we turn not simply just to the Torah, but to the entire Tanakh. And that's where we find ourselves this morning, in Micha, Micah, chapter 7. Micah is an interesting book. It sits in between the book of Jonah, which is all about Jonah's turmoil in his soul as he has to go to the city of Nineveh and preach repentance. And lo and behold, they repent and they receive the mercy of God. And then the book right after Micah 
is also to do with Nineveh, and we'll start on that in a few weeks. That book of Nahum, which means comfort, is far from being comfort to the people of Nineveh because it too is a book of the Bible that is dedicated to this one city, Nineveh. And it is a book that ends with the prediction of God's judgment and destruction upon the city. And in the book of Nahum, there is no mercy upon the people of Nineveh because clearly their repentance had not been sincere. It had not been long-lasting. It had not been deep. And so here is Micah in the midst of that. Two books addressed or treating the city of Nineveh. And Micah is a book that deals with the children of Jerusalem and of Samaria, the two great cities of the children of Israel, and cities that have pursued different paths, but both of them have failed. The city of Jerusalem has pursued the path of following God, but they have not done so from the heart. A bit like the people of Nineveh, they have not, not truly loved him with all of their heart, and their ritual has become dry and meaningless. And on the other side, there's the city of Samaria. And the city of Samaria has deliberately and forthrightly gone away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and is now worshiping golden calves, and is not following God at all. The book of Micah is addressed to these cities. But there is a difference between Jerusalem and Samaria and Nineveh, because Jerusalem and Samaria are the cities of people whom God has a covenant with. And God is doing a different thing with the children of Israel because his punishment with the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is not a punishment meant simply to execute justice in the earth. But his punishment upon them is the punishment of a parent, the punishment of one who cares for the ultimate outcome of his children's well-being. And as a parent, for his reputation as the God of Israel for all of the earth. God is actually working with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the book of Micah. Now, we have just come through the season of repentance. We've heard the shofar blast on Rosh Hashanah. We have remembered the need for repentance and turned to God, uh, confessing our sins on Yom Kippur. And um, we have rejoiced in God dwelling with us through the celebration of Sukkot, the season of our joy that recounts how God dwells with his people. Uh, there is a story of a man who came to Yom Kippur, and uh, he was a house painter. And he deeply regretted on this day stealing from his clients because what he would do is he would charge the clients for the painting, but he would take his paint and he would thin it down. So on every house he painted, he would save a few gallons of paint. And of course, it all adds up at $50 a gallon. Um, and over multiple houses, he, he was actually increasing the amount of profit that he was making. But the houses really didn't have good quality paint on them because it had been thinned. And, it was, and after a few years, that paint would begin to peel much more quickly than if he had used the paint the way it was meant to be. And so he felt very guilty about this. So he came on Yom Kippur to the synagogue and he began to confess what he was doing. And as he davened, as he prayed, he was pouring out his heart to the Lord. And a booming voice came down from heaven and decreed, repaint, repaint, 
and thin no more. <laughs> now, God is a merciful God. And while it's a joke, it tells us that God actually does call us to make amends, repaint, and to go and sin no more, to turn from our evil ways. The book of Micah has been all about that. It has been about God speaking to the children of Israel and, and speaking to them about their sin and the judgment that God was going to bring upon them. But it is also about God's mercy, about how God says, I'm not going to leave this situation the way it is. I am going to make the Jer Jerusalem the place from which the law shall go forth. The word of the Lord, for out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And God's concern with Jerusalem and with Zion is more than just for that city. But there will come a day when nation will not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. And as God predicts what he is going to do, as he works among his people, and as he transforms them, bringing them to the shape that he wants them to be, he points out that there is going to come a ruler who will be little among the thousands of Judah. Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old from everlasting. So this ruler, this great ruler, will come forth from this little town, Bethlehem Ephrata, and he will be far more than any ruler that has ever lived, because his goings forth are from everlasting. And as the Lord speaks through Micah the prophet, he appeals to the people of Israel. And he says to them in chapter 6 and verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But sadly, that is not the way they are living in Micah's day. And he says at the end of chapter 6, to his hearers. The statutes of Omri are kept. All the works of Ahab's house are done, and you walk in their councils. These were wicked kings. That I may make you a desolation, your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore, you shall bear the reproach of my people. So that's all introduction. That brings us to chapter 7, the last chapter in the book of Micah, where the Lord brings his message through this prophet to a conclusion so that they might know who he is. Because God is concerned what he is doing with Israel, but he is also concerned with what effect that will have in the world. And so Micah continues. In chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, documenting the faithlessness of God's people. And he says, chapter 7 and verse 1, Woe is me, Elalai Li. Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. There is not much left. The harvest has come in, and the prophet feels like he is just one of those last pieces of fruit, and not such great fruit at that. The nation has gone away. The nation has fallen away from the Lord, and there are few that remain that are faithful. 
And he is like those who gather the fruit and there is not much left. And his soul is not satisfied by what he sees in the nation. There are few who are righteous. Sometimes you know, Richard prayed as, as he does regularly when in our prayers for the, the people of Israel in this city. And we look at our people, Israel, and we say there are not so many among us who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, who can see and have realized that God has kept his promise to his people and has sent Messiah to us and that we can now rejoice in him as great as our rejoicing is in the Torah that he has given us, how much greater our rejoicing could be in the one who is God's Torah, God's word to us. We look at our nation, we look at our people, and we see that there are few among us who have rejoiced in Messiah, Yeshua. Things are bleak. We wish and we hope for more. There is little, there is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. And the prophet continues in verse 2. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood while every man hunts his brother with a net. And we see a commentary on a society that's a lot like our society today. Our society is one in which there are few who are faithful. There are few who are upright. And in fact, they all lie await for blood. We see this every three to five years when there's an election. All the knives come out during the election period. You can see what is really going on under the, 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 um, under, under the covers. You, you can see, you know, the real hostilities that are there, not only among the politicians, but among Canadians in the U.S., among Americans. You can see how deeply divided our people can be. They all lie await, in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. You can definitely see this if you follow American politics right now. Everyone is out to get everyone else. There is no real desire to hear the other side. There's very little desire for compromise, for discussion, for working things out. People are waiting for blood. They're hunting for each other with a net. Um, I just saw a little clip on the news the other day, someone introducing a, a, a motion to impeach the U.S. president. Um, that, that there's, there's strong feelings. And this is the world that the prophet is describing. It's not only in politics. We see it in business. We see it um, where, where people hold different ethical standards in their business than they would in their day-to-day -day life. Everyone is on the hunt. The prophet says this is not right. It's not right that we should be treating one another this way, and it's not right that we should be attacking. And then he speaks about what's happening to the people of the land and what's happening among the wealthy. And again, we see things that are very reminiscent of what's happening in our world today. People are hunting because, so that they may successfully do evil with both hands. They want to be successful in what they are doing. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bride. And the great man utters his evil desire. People are corrupt. They, we see corruption. We don't have to look too far. This week's news shows tremendous corruption in Hollywood as one man's evil desire has been exposed. 
And the reason that everyone knows that this is big news is not just because that one man, but because it exposes a whole system across an industry that has allowed this kind of corruption to have continued. And if it has continued with the one man, how many others have been committing the same kind of abuse and evil in order to grasp with both hands to get what they want to satisfy their own desires. I was in England just a few years ago where England has just gone through the same thing with a guy called Jimmy Savile. Jim will fix it was his show. And it took years to root out the evil and in reality we're pretty sure it's not all rooted out in the United Kingdom. The evil that exposed a whole system of unrighteousness. That is the world that we live in. If you want to seek for righteousness, this is what the next verse says. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. If you want justice, it's really going to cost you. You will get cut. You will get impaled by the thorns in the hedge as you reach in and as you try to get justice. And we know that's true in our world today. You know that if you want justice, it's really not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. And so the prophet is recounting what he is seeing happening in his society. It's the same world then as we live in today an unjust, evil world where men are seeking their own advancement at the cost of others. And so the prophet says, the day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. And he says in verse 5, very distressingly, do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your life from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. There's no one you can trust, he says. This is the situation that, it is, that we are in today. Households are divided. The rabbis said to this, and maybe rightly so, guard the doors of your mouth. Nothing should come out of your mouth other than that which is right from the Torah. Speak of those things which are of God. Let your words be those words that God would approve of. Let the words of your mouth be righteous. Because we are in a world where our words, our careless words, can be misconstrued and taken to be evil. You cannot stand for righteousness in our society today without running the risk of condemnation. It's not just in Canada, other countries as well. Well, that's a pretty pitiful story, a pretty pitiful start to the chapter, because it shows a really sad situation. And uh, yeah, we know that our world's a bit like that too. And we live in a very blessed uh, part of the world. Um, and if you live in the Vancouver area, you're living in one of the most beautiful cities of the world, one of the most blessed places. And yet you only have to drive down East Hastings and you realize there's a lot of sadness here, too. There's a lot of wealth, a lot of beauty, a lot of good, but a lot of sadness and pain in our society. So what does the prophet do? He does what we can do. Verse 7, we've seen the faithfulness, faithlessness of mankind. Now we can see the faithfulness of God. Therefore, I will look to Hashem. 
I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You have to be really careful what you say to people in our world, even to the, with those you are most intimate with sometimes. But God will hear me. I can say anything I want to God. He will hear. He is just. He is righteous. He is true. I will look to the Lord, the prophet says. That is who I will turn my eyes to. He no doubt has in his mind the psalms that have been sung in Jerusalem at the temple, where we turn our eyes to the Lord and we rejoice in him. I will wait for the God of my salvation, he says, and he uses the word Yeshua, yish -e. I will wait for the God of my salvation. This is the one that we look to. And in fact, that's where our eyes should really be. And I'm reminding myself now, sometimes we can spend an awful lot of time, just like we did in verses 1 to 6, seeing what's wrong with the world. But God says, turn your eyes to me. Turn your eyes to the God of our salvation, my salvation. My God will hear me. The princes and the nobles and the courts might not hear our plea, but God will hear. Verse 8, do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. He is my light. He is my salvation. What a wonderful hope we have. Our world is in desperate straits. We are in desperate straits because we are sinners too. And so we shouldn't just be looking outside. But God is our light. He is our salvation. The prophet says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord. You know, it's right sometimes that we are chastised by the Lord, whom he, chast he chastises us as children. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. But here it is, until he pleads my case. The one that we have sinned against pleads our case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I will see his righteousness. What a wonderful gift we have in Messiah, the one who has been already announced in chapter 6 and verse, um, or rather chapter 5 and verse 2, the ruler in Israel. What a blessing we have that we look to him and that we can, because of him, know that God, our judge, has already and also appointed an advocate for us who appeals for us in his heavenly throne and who is our light and our righteousness. God executes justice for us in mercy and faithfulness. Then we read in verse 10, my enemy will see. Shame will cover her who said to him, to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets in the days when your walls are to be built. In that day, the decree shall go far and wide. There are those who might look and they will say, where is your God? And frankly, a lot of society says that. Why do you bother taking a day to worship the Lord, to be with his people? What is so important about that? You know, be up on Cypress Mountain in a few weeks, cross-country skiing. There's all kinds of things you can do. They might look. 
They might criticize, but ultimately the vindication is there and righteousness will be shown. In that day, we read in verse 12, they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea, and mountain to mountain. The land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. God is faithful. God is going to bring righteousness. But for those of us who have turned our eyes to him, we have his advocate for us in Messiah, Yeshua. He executes justice for us, and he brings us forth to the light. The picture is not all bleak. It's not all bad. We don't have to be that worried about what is happening in the world because God is bringing righteousness out of it. And so in verses 14 to 20, we have God vindicated. God being vindicated. The, chef, the prophet appeals to the Lord once again. Shepherd your people with your staff the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days of old. A shepherd carries a staff, and as you know, it's got many purposes. You can use it to fend off wild animals. You can use it to uh, catch your sheep's attention by wrapping it on a rock or, or making a noise with it. You can use it to grab your sheep with the crook and pull it along in the right way um, using the hook around its neck. And you can actually use it to give your sheep a wrap on the head, a little bit of discipline. There's a lot of things you can do with a staff when you're a shepherd. And uh, the prophet says, Shep shepherd your people with your staff, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, he shepherds us with his staff, the flock of your heritage. You know, all those things can be done with a staff, but the flock is still the shepherd's flock, even if he has to discipline it, whether he is leading it, guiding it, or disciplining. It is his flock and we are his flock. And the prophet's cry is, here we are, your people. Shepherd us, lead us, and guide us. And that is our plea for Israel. Lord, shepherd Israel, guide Israel, keep her from enemies, protect her. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Gilead uh, and Car and Bashan are places that are mentioned in the scripture where one can shepherd one's fleek, their sheep. There are places with great pastures. Carmel could refer to Carmel, but it can also refer to any place that is beautiful, that is a good place where you might find vineyards, where you might find um, places to shepherd your sheep. Let them be blessed. Let Israel be blessed as in days of old. Verse 15, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The Lord speaks. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. Who is a God like you? We can see the way the book ends. We can see the way God is directing and he is leading. God is working among his people. Even today, Israel has her enemies. Iran is promising to use nuclear power against Israel. You don't have to visit Israel, although I hope you will visit Israel soon. Um, 
and I'm hoping we can arrange something in our Kehila in a year or two. Um, but you don't have to go there. You just need to look at a map to see how small Israel is, three major cities. A hit on any of those major cities um, by a nuclear bomb would devastate the nation and put its very survival in, in uh, huge danger. We live in a world where the nations are kind of blinking at that. They're saying, oh, well, it's not such a big deal that nations are threatening Israel like this. Uh, they're more concerned with their own peace and well-being than the safety of a nation that could be obliterated in a moment by a nation that is promising to do that very thing. So when I see, verse 16, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might, and I see what's happened in the world today with Iran being decertified by one of the nations of the world as being in compliance with... Um, with, with its obligations to stop developing nuclear weapons. And I look at all the others, and the facts are Iran intends to continue its nuclear program. How uh, quickly or not is the only question, and they've made that clear. I see that the nations may well have to be ashamed of all their might because they are putting God's people in such mortal terrible danger from a sworn enemy. So we now, like our prophet, turn our eyes to God. And we can say, who is a God like you? There is no God like our God. We can put our trust in our God for the people of Israel and for us in our individual circumstances as well. We can put our trust in him, knowing that he is trustworthy, knowing that he will keep faith with us, and knowing that he will adjudicate for us, having given, given us a Messiah, Messiah's work being the basis on which he executes justice for us. Justice that is beyond justice. It is merciful justice. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? I am so thankful that God pardons iniquity, pardons mine, and he pardons yours, each one of us. Wow. Thankfully, we have a God who pardons iniquity, and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. As he revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. This is what our God delights in. It's the very thing that he asked of us in chapter 6, Verse 8, he said, He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly and to love mercy. God not only loves mercy, but he delights in it. He will again have compassion on us. This is God's promise. He will subdue our iniquities. And we need that. We need a God will actually subdue our iniquities because it is so easy for us to fall into sin. And on Yom Kippur, this is part of the prayers. That, and it is part of the prayers in the, in, in the confessions that, and in the daily prayers. And Lord, turn our hearts to you that we may be turned. Subdue our iniquities. Give us a heart that is after you that follows after you. And on Rosh Hashanah, we do this very thing in verse 19. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. 
And on Rosh Hashanah, during the Tashlich ceremony, one goes to the sea or to a lake or a river and casts one's sins away symbolically into that living water, ideally water where there are fish that can see what we are doing. Um, but the beauty is, this isn't us casting our sins away, because I can guarantee any of us who did Tashlich on Rosh Hashanah, between then and now, we've had a sinful thought, we've said a sinful thing, we've done a sinful thing, that's our nature. We, we do it, and hopefully we've noticed it and confessed it. But this is God casting all our sins away. And that's way better than me casting my sins away into a river or a lake. He casts all of our sins into the depths of the sea. And so here we are, and we can go, wow, that is the kind of God that we have. This is what he says about himself. This is what he loves to do. You will give truth to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. God is a covenant-keeping God. What a wonderful God we have. You know, part of God's covenant mercy is seen even in the restoration of Israel to her homeland today. Nobody thought that that was really going to happen for a couple thousand years, really. Nobody thought that it was possible that we could have our own land again ever since the third or fourth century. It just didn't seem like that was going to happen. And yet today we are in our own land, our Tsenu, as we sing in our national anthem. We are in the city of Jerusalem, and we are, to some degree, even living at peace. God has kept his promises to Israel, and he will keep those promises which he has sworn to our fathers from days of old. The messianic revival, which swept across the Jewish world, first in the 1890s in Europe, Toronto, New York, those were the, really the hubs, a little bit in Chicago and Florida, but uh, Toronto, New York, and, and uh, Europe. We saw a revival as Jewish people began to come to Messiah, and the Messianic movement was born. That was of God, not, in, not since the early church had so many Jewish people come to faith. And on top of that, known that they could continue to live as Jews. That was the amazing thing, so that by the 1930s, there were over 100,000, probably over 200,000 or more Jewish believers in Europe before the Holocaust. An amazing revival of the Lord. We're seeing God's revival and his faithfulness among his people in the mes modern Messianic movement, which began after the Six-Day War. And we saw that revival here in Vancouver in the... Uh, very late 70s, but into the 80s, uh, Zion Messianic Fellowship, which is Kehilat Zion, was founded in 1985 by Jewish believers who before then had just not existed in the city of Vancouver. Um, we saw Jewish people coming to the Lord across North America, in England, the Mes London Messianic Fellowship, founded in 1980. Um, God has been faithful, and God is doing an amazing work. And so we look to our faithful God, knowing that he will be true to his word. What a rejoicing we have when we look at him. The book of Nahum doesn't end like this. The uh, book of Micah ends speaking of the mercies of our God. The book of Nahum ends with how the nations of the world will just clap their hands in amazement on the judgment that comes upon Nineveh. That's the difference between those who turn to God and those who don't. What a great God we have. We can turn our eyes to him and we can experience his forgiveness and, his, and rejoice in him 
experiencing his mercy. Avinu Shava Shamayim, we thank you for Messiah Yeshua. We thank you that he came and that he is the basis for that righteousness and forgiveness for our iniquities that the prophet speaks of. We thank you that he comes and has come from Bethlehem Ephrata, just as the prophet said, and that he is ruler over all the earth. We thank you for our Messiah. We thank you for Yeshua, our Messiah. We thank you that we can walk in his ways. We thank you that we can turn our eyes to you this day. In Yeshua's name, amen.